I'm going to talk about tonight. So insects, and particularly bumblebees, are my kind of specialist subject, and I've been obsessed by them all my life. Um, I don't know where it came from, you know, when I was, I, I've got these memories from when I was about five years old of um, uh, collecting caterpillars from, I, I found these little yellow and black caterpillars on the edge of the school playground and uh, um, put them in my lunchbox and took them home and reared them up and they turned into these beautiful scarlet and black moths and I thought it was just amazing. You probably recognise them as cinnabar caterpillars and moths. And I was hooked and I've been, I've been uh, lucky enough to make a career studying insects. People pay me to do this, which is, which is amazing. Um, but I think actually many people have a bug phase. This is, this is my youngest son, Seth, and he's still very much in his, his bug phase. Um, he's, he loves them. He, he can't, he, anything he can catch in his hands, put in a jam jar, feed and look after. And he just finds them completely fascinating. This is, this is, um, Seth with his pet cockchafer, Colin, who's sadly no longer with us, but, um, uh, uh, Rest in peace, Colin. Um, but Seth, as I say, he still loves insects. But sadly, somehow, most people grow out of any childhood interest in insects. And by the time they're adults, they're frightened of insects. But if anything buzzes past them, their first reaction is to swat it, to flap at it. They think it's going to sting them or bite them or give them a disease or something. And that's really sad because insects are amazing. They're, they're wonderful, beautiful creatures. And also they're really, really important. So my mission in life is to try and persuade people to, to love insects, or at least to respect insects for what they do for all of us. Um, and that's important because worrying that insects are in decline, as you'll have gathered from the title of the talk, if nothing else. And I'm sure you've heard this from other sources. Um, so I could show you lots of pieces of evidence, but one of the most dramatic pieces of evidence for insect declines came from Germany. It was published in 2017. It was a study that I was peripherally involved in. And it's based on catches of flying insects in malaise traps. That is, top right there is a malaise trap, which is a, uh, a kind of tent-like thing which catches flying insects. They, they bump into it and they crawl into a bottle of alcohol and end up pickled, poor things. Um, but anyway, the, the graph shows you the, uh, the daily weight of insects caught at traps all across Germany between 1989 and 2016. Um, and in that 26 year period, you can see the numbers fell a lot, the weight of insects, it actually fell by 76% in 26 years. That's really not very long and seemingly three quarters of the insects in the flying insects in Germany disappeared over that period. It was pretty terrifying. Uh, and this really caused alarm bells around the world. There were uh, newspaper articles in almost every country about this study. But it's not the only piece of evidence. We have corroborative evidence from the UK, for example, for our butterflies, which sadly uh, we, we monitor very well. And sadly, they're, they're in rapid decline, many of them. Uh, we know that uh, our wild bees, our moths, our hoverflies, our caribou beetles are all declining, with a few exceptions. There are individual species booking the trend, but the, sadly the overall trend is downwards in the UK, in Germany, and so far as we know, um, everywhere else. Uh, I won't depress you anymore with graphs showing similar things. Um, I'll turn to why it matters. So, um, it was put probably best of all by um, Ed Wilson, who's a, an American scientist, who's actually an ant specialist. And, and this is a quote from him. If all mankind were to disappear, the world would regenerate back to the rich state of equilibrium that existed 10,000 years ago. So basically, if people were to disappear, the planet would do extremely well without us. Um, but if insects were to vanish, um, the environment would collapse into chaos, was how he put it. And he's absolutely right. And I want to explain why insects are important. So, well, first of all, insects make up the bulk of life on Earth. They, we've named about one and a half million species of animal and plant on our planet, of which about one million, two thirds, are different types of insects. So they are biodiversity. 
Um, but then they're also food for a good deal of the remaining biodiversity. Most bird species, bats, lizards, amphibians, freshwater fish, they all eat insects. So if, for example, you're a bee eater living in Germany, then three quarters of your food supply has disappeared in the last uh, few years, which um, is obviously going to impact on populations of all these other creatures too. But insects do many other things besides being food. They're involved in almost every ecological process you can think of. Um, so, for example, they're, they're vitally important biocontrol agents of um, crop pests, things like ladybirds and hoverflies and lacewings and uh, soldier beetles and earwigs and so on. Uh, they're also intimately involved in nutrient cycles, in recycling uh, uh, cow pats, as in the dung beetle top right there, or dead bodies, as a carrion beetle there, the red and black one, um, uh, and dead trees and dead leaves and all sorts of other materials. Uh, they help to keep the soil healthy, they distribute seeds, they do all sorts of things that are vitally important. The best known of which is pollination, of course, um, uh, which is actually done uh, by many species. People immediately think of bees when you mention pollination, but actually pollination is done by butterflies and moths and many different species of fly and wasps and beetles and so on, as well as bees. And elsewhere in the world by birds and bats and even lizards get in on the act. But in Europe, it's all done by insects. And between these pollinators, 87% of all the plant species in the world um, get pollinated. They, they're all reliant on animal pollinators of one sort or another. So basically the very large majority of all plants wouldn't have any offspring, wouldn't set any seeds if it weren't for pollinating uh, insects and other creatures. From a human perspective, uh, roughly 75% of all the crop species that we, we grow in the world need pollinating by insects. So we've become accustomed to supermarkets full of this amazing array of, of fruits and vegetables, often flown in from all over the world and available for 12 months of the year. Um, if we didn't have pollinators, things wouldn't look so rosy. Uh, we wouldn't have many of the, these lovely fruits and veg. We wouldn't have strawberries or raspberries or apples or tomatoes or chili peppers or, or I could go on and on, coffee, chocolate. Life would be awful um, without such things. And, and in fact, in, um, more than awful, um, literally millions uh, of people would starve um, if, we, if we didn't have pollinating insects. So we really do need to look after them. And to do that, we need to understand why they're declining. Um, now, this is complicated, and I could talk about it for quite a, a while, um, uh, but I'll skim over it and just kind of highlight the main um, drivers of insect declines. Biggest of all is habitat loss, which I'll say a tiny bit more about in a second. Uh, and relating to that is, is the growth in use of pesticides. Um, modern farming uses a lot of pesticides. Um, on average, each field gets about 17 sprays a year um, or 17 applications a year. If you want to know more details, ask me later. Um, then there are also issues with foreign diseases, insect diseases that we've spread around the world. Climate change is starting to kick in. Fertilizers have an impact on plants, which have big knock on effects for insects. Light pollution is having impacts on nocturnal insects and so on. But probably from the point of view of pollinating insects in particular, the biggest loss, uh, the biggest impact was the loss of, of flower-rich grasslands. In the UK, we used to have, in the region of, of 7 million acres of habitat, sorry, 7 million hectares of habitat like this, uh, full of flowers, uh, lowland hay meadows, upland hay meadows, chalk downland, all of it was super rich in, in different plant species, and supported a, a, a wonderful and diverse community of, of insects. But in the 20th century, we lost nearly all, 97, 98% of this habitat was swept away between 1930 and the late 1980s, um, replaced by this kind of thing, arable crops, which support almost no biodiversity at all, 
Um, or since seeing as I'm talking to the Devon Wildlife Trust today, um, I put in a picture of the kind of Devon equivalent. Um, modern pastures are, are almost as um, hostile to biodiversity as, um, as arable crops. Um, very often improved pastures um, consist of, of more or less a monoculture of one species of grass. Um, uh, very, very boring from a wildlife perspective. And there's an awful lot of this kind of bleak uh, wildlife free habitat all over Britain, sadly, these days. So what can we do? Let's let's be cheerful um, and get past the doom and gloom. Um, the good news is there's lots that uh, we can all do. So unlike many of these big environmental issues, you know, climate change, the rainforest being cut down, um, to, polar bears, ice caps melting, all these things, you feel completely helpless. What can you do? Um, it feels like anything you can do is trivial. Um, but with insects, the great thing is that it's not too late. Few of them have actually gone extinct. They can recover really quickly if we give them habitat, if we provide them some, with somewhere to live, something to eat, and we stop poisoning them, they'll recover. And because they live all around us, there's an opportunity for, for us all to get involved. They live in our gardens, in our parks, in our road verges, they, they live everywhere. In, in surprising numbers, actually. So there was a, a study by a, um, an ecologist uh, a, a based in Leicester, Jenny Owen, um, who spent 35 years cataloguing all the species she could find in her little urban garden in Leicester. And she, in total, found 2,600 and something species of animal and plants, of which 2,000 were species of insect in one small garden. So anyone with even a little garden has insects that they can help. So I have this kind of vision in which um, all of the gardens in, in Britain are insect friendly. Uh, maybe I'm a bit uh, optimistic here, but let's, let's be bold. Um, I, I am, so currently there are something like 500,000 hectares of gardens in the UK. as a bigger area than all of our nature reserves. So, just imagine they were all full of bee-friendly flowers and pesticide-free and so on. Um, and imagine too, if all the councils came on board and all the road verges and roundabouts and city parks and cemeteries and so on and so on were also uh, being managed for wildlife, um, then that's a huge network of habitat for insects, ready-made. Well, not ready-made, but it's, an easy, it, it's easily achievable. We could do it. We could do it in a very short space of time and there's no real downside to doing this. Um, I've written a book about it. Apologies for plugging my own book, but if you want to know more um, about how you can uh, um, um, invite insects in to live in your garden and generally garden in a more uh, planet-friendly way, then, then um, do get hold of a copy. Uh, so what can we do specifically in our gardens to make them more insect-friendly? Well, there are a whole range of things. I'm just going to skim through some of them. Firstly, you could mow less. Um, this is a really easy thing to do. Do less, be lazy. It saves you petrol, saves you time and sweat. Um, we British people are strangely obsessed by lawns and many people, including my dad, um, aspire to having a, a stripy kind of Wimbledon tennis court in our back garden. Um, we mow it every week or two obsessively through the spring and summer. It's nuts that a lawn like that supports almost no life at all. Um, if you just stop mowing, most lawns have flowers in them, just waiting for the chance to flower. So this is my lawn and I haven't added any wildflower seeds at all. I just reduced the, the I don't mow very often. In fact, I haven't mown this year, uh, that particular lawn. Uh, and you can see it's got red and white clover and buttercups and uh, there's cell field there and the speedwell. There's all sorts of lovely flowers in there which attract lots of insects. Um, so if you, can, if you can reduce your mowing and ideally leave some areas of lawn um, unmown all year, um, just cut them once a year, have your, you, you've got your own wildlife meadow in your back garden. How cool is that? Similarly, um, we could do a lot with road verges and roundabouts and other urban spaces. So this photo was taken in Stirling in Scotland and this sea of wildflowers that you can uh, see in front of you is the work of a little local community group that call themselves On The Verge, who spend their weekends planting wildflower seed mixes 
on any bit of amenity grassland they can get their hands on. There are nearly a hundred patches like this all over the city of Stirling now, all due to this one little group of people. That's a roundabout, as you can see. Just imagine if every roundabout and every road verge in Britain was planted up with flowers like that. Wouldn't that be cool? OK, so that's, that, that would all help a lot. Uh, what else can we do? I think we can be more tolerant. Uh, so there's something else we can do less of rather than more of. Spend less time desperately trying to, to eradicate weeds, things like dandelions and thistles and ragwort. Um, they're all native wildflowers. So if I could give you kind of one gardening tip, you can get rid of all the weeds in your garden, just the click of a finger, by just reimagining them as wildflowers instead, because that's basically what they are. Um, and all of the plants here, uh, are really good for wildlife. So we, sh we should maybe give them a little bit of room if we possibly can. Ragwort, for example, is often demonized for the, the supposed poisoning of thousands of horses. Um, but actually, it's, it's a native plant. And if it's growing in a pasture, horses won't eat it. It's only actually dangerous if we're foolish enough to make uh, hay with a large proportion of ragwort in it. Uh, so let's be more tolerant of these plants that support a lot of native wildlife. And let's stop doing things like this. It really makes me weep to see this kind of thing. What harm was that little bit of vegetation doing? Was it really necessary to spray it with herbicide? Almost certainly glyphosate, uh, which is actually a, a, it's been linked to cancers. There's some court battles raging in the United States, but uh, all of them that have taken place so far have found, that, found against uh, Monsanto, um, the company that make glyphosate. Um, uh, anyway, whether or not it causes cancer, it's, it's not something we really should be spraying all over our city streets um, and along the edges of children's playgrounds and in our back gardens and so on. Um, and more broadly, um, I personally think we should have not, we don't need any pesticides in our gardens and in our urban areas. Um, inspiringly, France has banned all pesticides for use in urban areas by gardeners, by local authorities, by anybody. Um, if France can do it, if Paris can survive without pesticides, then surely we can do it too. And this is, this is a, you know, again, it's really a, a no regret solution. There's no downside that I can see, apart from live with the sight of the odd dandelion poking up through the gaps in the pavement. I actually think that would be rather nice. If you do have insect pests in your garden. Um, for example, you see some aphids on your roses or some black fly on your runner beans or whatever. Um, you could dash to the shop and buy insecticide, but I would urge you, please don't do that. Um, instead, just hold fire, hold your nerve and wait for the cavalry. There's a whole bunch of insect species that will come to your rescue. And I do this every year and it, uh, honestly, it, it works. I very rarely lose a vegetable crop or see much damage done to my flowers by insect pests because my garden is full of hoverflies and ladybirds and parasitic wasps and all these other wonderful creatures that uh, help to consume any pests. So you, ha you have some aphids, but that's a good thing because that means you then also you have food for the predators. The ecosystem is in balance, if you like. As soon as you spray a pesticide, you kill not just the aphids or whatever pest you're targeting, but all of these creatures as well. And you can guarantee the pests will come back faster and harder uh, because they no longer have any natural enemies. Of course, the obvious thing you can do in your garden to make it more wildlife and particularly more insect friendly is plant lots of bee friendly flowers, bee friendly, butterfly friendly, nectar rich, pollen rich flowers. And I could talk for hours about this, but broadly the idea is to um, you can sum it up as old fashioned cottage garden flowers and herbs tend to be good. If you want more detail, I have made loads of YouTube videos about the best flowers for uh, pollinators at different months of the year. So have a look at those. I'm just going to show you a few pretty pictures now. Um, uh, so this is catmint, an absolutely fabulous plant for bees. I would recommend everybody who's got a garden to have a, at least one catmint. Um, things like borage attracts thousands of bees. Lavender, of course, is a classic. Um, comfrey, beautiful uh, wildflower that attracts lots and lots and lots of bees because it produces tons of, of nectar. 
there's, in fact, you can you can grow lots of wildflowers in your garden, and the more the better, as far as I'm concerned. Um, people sometimes think that wildflowers are, are weeds. Uh, we've already talked about weeds, but a weed is just an artificial concept. All flowers were wildflowers once, and many of them look really beautiful in your garden. If I could just highlight one of these, top left, Vipers bugloss, is um, a really stunning, beautiful native plant. I always grow it every year in my garden and it attracts swarms and swarms of, of bees. And it looks really at home, either in an untidy wildlife garden or in a formal flower bed. If you can squeeze in a flowering tree or two, many of us don't have room for a, a lime tree or a horse chestnut tree in our garden. If you do, that's fantastic because the amount of flowers a flowering tree can support is far greater than you could squeeze into a flower bed of equivalent footprint. Um, if you've only got a tiny garden, you might still consider squeezing in uh, a fruit tree like an apple on a dwarfing rootstock. Um, you can get uh, tiny ones that will grow in a pot on a patio, in fact. And if you plant a tree, if you have got room for a tree of any size, um, something like a, an apple tree, it provides blossom for the bees in the spring, which is fantastic. It provides you with zero food miles apples later in the year. And as it grows, it locks up carbon. So everyone's a winner. Do beware when buying plants from the garden center that they're almost certainly uh, laced with pesticides. Um, this is the, a sad truth that we discovered um, three years ago, my research group at Sussex. We screened plants being sold as bee friendly or perfect for pollinators um, from all the big name garden centers and almost every single plant we bought contained a bunch of pesticides. 75% of them had insecticides, 70% had neonicotinoid insecticides, which are especially toxic to bees. I think it's an absolute outrage that you can buy, uh, you know, a plant, you're trying to help the bees, you spend your hard earned money and accidentally you're poisoning the bees because garden centers are irresponsibly mislabeling products. There's nothing bee friendly about a plant full of pesticides. Also beware, while I'm on the subject of pesticides, um, are, are flea treatments that uh, your vet might recommend for your dog or cat. Um, the most common flea treatment used on um, dogs and cats in this country is Advocate, which is the active ingredient is something called imidacloprid. It's a neonicotinoid insecticide. And the amount you're supposed to drip on your dog's neck every uh, month is enough to kill 60 million honeybees. That's about four big lorries loaded with dead bees. Those few drops that go on your dog every month could do that, it's so potent. It's a neurotoxin. Um, and they're water soluble and quite persistent. So if your dog jumps in the local canal, for example, or a pond or a river, it's all gonna wash off. And that's a huge dose of insecticides swilling into the aquatic environment. One final thing you can do in your garden um, to support bees in particular is put up a bee hotel. Most people are familiar with this idea now. Uh, bee hotels um, that cater for solitary bees. These are bees most people know a bit less about than bumblebees or honeybees. These are bees that live on their own. Um, and some of them like horizontal burrows to nest in. Um, so on the left there is an old fence post. It looks really ugly, but I drilled some holes in it. Um, and within 20 minutes of drilling the holes, uh, this was springtime a few years ago, um, I had my first red mason bee top right there coming to investigate. And then later in the year, leaf cutter bees like that one bottom right come. They're on the wing right now, actually, in July. And that's really ugly as bee hotels go. You can make much nicer ones out of bits of bamboo or nice neat pieces of unrotted wood. Um, hole diameter between about five and 10 millimeters. Uh, is perfect. Um, or you can buy bee hotels, a bit expensive, but this one is fantastic because it has a window on the side so you can see what's happening inside. And my kids really love this because they can peek in and, and see the, the bees developing. Um, so those are the offspring of red mason bees and you can see little lines of cells with uh, piles of yellow pollen and uh, little creamy colored grubs developing on each pile of pollen. Fascinating to watch. Okay, so if we all did all of those things, we could turn our, hopefully, 
our gardens into into a kind of giant network of nature uh, of nature reserves and mini nature reserves all across the country i think that would be really cool but sadly 70 percent of britain is farmland and unless we can make that more insect friendly then then whatever we do in our gardens is not going to really solve all of the problems that insects face now i haven't got time to to, to go into this in detail but, uh, but i just thought i'd say a few words because I personally think we need to radically change the farming system. I think our current farming system is broken. It's damaging the environment. It's wiping out biodiversity. It's damaging the soil. We've seen a huge soil erosion around the world, loss of carbon from the soil, which goes into the atmosphere. And broadly, farming contributes hugely to greenhouse gas emissions. About 30% of all greenhouse gas emissions are associated with farming. Um, it's not sustainable the way we're doing it. It's polluting rivers and streams with fertilizers and pesticides and so on and so on and so on. Um, so is there another way of feeding everybody? Do we have to have these big monocultures of crops drenched in pesticides? I don't think we do. Um, I, as I say, I haven't got time to go into detail. This would require at least an entire talk on its own. Um, but I just wanted to say a, a, a few things. So firstly, People think we have to farm intensively to feed everybody, but actually we currently grow about three times as many calories as would be required to feed everybody on the planet. And we grow way more food than we need. Nobody starves because there isn't enough food. They starve because they're too poor to buy it. Um, uh, so we grow three times, essentially three times as much as we need. What do we do with it all? Well, a third of it goes to waste. Um, and a third of it is fed to animals rather than people in intensive indoor rearing units, um, uh, which is a hugely inefficient way of feeding people. I'm not suggesting everyone should go vegan or vegetarian. I'm neither, but I treat meat, I see meat as a treat to be eaten occasionally rather than all the time. And in particular, we should avoid indoor reared grain fed red meat, beef and so on, because that's spectacularly inefficient at feeding people. And it's bizarre that roughly three quarters of all the farmland in the world is used to eat as, either as grazing land or um, to produce crops which are fed to animals. And yet meat provides us, meat and dairy products, provides us with about 8% of our nutrition from 75% of the land. It's, it's a pretty inefficient way of feeding everybody. So we waste loads of food, we eat too much meat, and we also eat too much and we eat the wrong stuff. So sorry about this picture. Um, it's a bit unpleasant to, to look at, but the harsh reality is 27% of the adults in the UK are now obese. And it's hugely expensive disease. Um, uh, it leads to diabetes and many other uh, conditions, heart disease and so on. Uh, it's costing the economy by coincidence, 27 billion pounds a year, according to government figures. That's, that's essentially directly due to poor diet. Uh, we eat way too many grains and processed foods, pies, pastries, pizza, pasta, cakes, biscuits, and so on, and nowhere near enough fruits and vegetables. We import 70% of our fruits and vegetables in this country, even though we have a country well suited to growing them. So if we wasted less food, ate less meat, and just ate less and more healthily, we could massively reduce the pressure of farming on the land. I think there are some really interesting alternative ways of farming which deserve lots of research and attention. Things like agroforestry, uh, which involves having trees mixed up with other crops, um, which helps to hold the soil together and capture carbon and, and so on, and increases biodiversity in the whole system enormously. And also, I personally got a lot of time for things like permaculture and biodynamic farming, both of which essentially are producing food, but working with nature at the same time. Um, and and they are examples of... of food product of farms that team with wildlife while producing food. They do, wildlife and food production need to go hand in hand, not be mutually exclusive as they have become. So broadly, I think we need to do less of that stuff on the left and more of something that looks more like what's on the right there. Okay, so to wrap up, um, this of course is our beautiful planet. It's an amazing thing. Um, it's everything we have. We depend entirely upon it. We are not going to live on Mars anytime soon. Um, and it's, it's astonishing. It's beautiful. It gives us everything we need. 
Um, and yet we're doing terrible harm to it. And we need to do better. Um, we need to, to, you know, most people would do anything for their children apart from apparently leave them a decent planet to live on. Um, so maybe we can start by looking after the things that live all around us, the, the insects in our gardens. Thank you, everybody, for listening. That is the end. Thank you, Dave. That was really good. Um, and I learned loads, so I'm sure other people did too. So what I'm going to do now is um, put some questions to you, if that's okay. Um, and these are in no particular order. Um, but there was one overarching um, point, I think, behind your talk that someone questioned. So I'll start with that one. And that is that this, this um, participant said, I understand that recordings at Rothamsted do not show universal insect declines. Is this true? So in other words, I think this person is questioning whether the insect declines that you talked about at the beginning of your talk are an actuality or is that, has that been challenged in some circles? Not by any sane person, I don't think. I mean, I think the evidence is overwhelming. The, the Rothamsted data, they, they have, there are four suction traps, which uh, one of which is based at Rothamsted and it's coordinated from Rothamsted, which they're, um, I, I forget how, 20 something metre tall traps that were designed to suck aphids out of the air as an aphid monitoring program. Uh, and the catches in those suction traps um, have not really, well, one of the four suction traps has seen a big decline and three have seen more or less flat line the whole time. But they're 90% of the catch are bibionid flies and nearly all one species of fly. So I don't think that really tells us terribly much about what's going on with the 27,000 species of insect that live in the UK. Um, the, data, the hard data we have for insects, the really detailed data are for butterflies, which are monitored very closely and which are down the rare ones 78% since 1976 and the common ones by 46%. Um, and we have really good data for those. Uh, the moths we have pretty good data for and they're down about 35% since 1980, if I remember. Um, bumblebee range, uh, wild bee ranges have contracted by 30%. Those are all, you know, indisputable kind of findings. So um, there seem to be one or two people out there that enjoy trying to kind of be controversial and deny the weight of evidence. But the very large majority of entomologists or scientists uh, accept that this is real. And it's a bit like climate change. You can find one or two people that disagree, but they're very much in a minority these days. Dave, just before we go on, thank you for that. Could you just put your, your video on again so that we can see you? Because otherwise people don't Yeah, know. sorry, I didn't realize, I didn't, <laughs> didn't turn it off, but it's, um, there, there, we, we go. there we go. You mentioned climate change there, and there's, we've got another question about that. And someone says very elegantly, is this the elephant hawk moth in the room? I mean, a lot of what you spoke about were individual actions to combat insect decline and, and precipitate their recovery. But is any of that worth it when we are now told there's, there's a climate change emergency? It, climate change is going to have huge impacts. There's no doubt at all. And, you know, some of the projections as to which species will be doomed to disappear in the UK um, as a result of climate change are really depressing. You know, many of our common bumblebees are forecast to, to not be here at all um, in, you know, 50 years time or whatever. Um, but almost all the evidence suggests that species can survive for longer and are more likely to survive if they have good habitat, if they have plenty of food, good places to nest or whatever else. So we can mitigate the impacts of climate change by looking after our insects, by creating habitat for them. We're not going to be, you know, that isn't going to prevent climate change from causing them harm. But if we continue to destroy their habitat and poison them and then inflict climate change on them as well. It will be much worse than if we do what we can um, to help them now. But I, I mean, it, it is, uh, you know, um, an enormous issue. And um, the, I think it's the combination of um, biodiversity loss and climate change together, which is more frightening than either of those issues in isolation. And they're so intertwined that, uh, you know, you, you can't really um, separate them. Okay, thank you. And as a follow-up to that, someone else has asked, as individuals, 
how do we get our government to take this seriously, um, this issue? Um, with difficulty. I mean, I, we, we need to engage with enough people. We need enough people to care, don't we? You know, at the end of the day, um, if everyone voted for the Green Party, would, we'd have a very different set of politicians. Um, whether that, you know, the Green Party would be able to cope with being in power is another question. But if there were enough votes in it, we would have much greener or more environmentally aware politicians. Um, so we need to, to, to raise the agenda with everybody that we can. We need to spread the word. We need to somehow convince the perhaps 90% of the population that right now, are just not engaged. They, just, they don't think the environment is relevant to them. They don't realise that the food in the supermarket actually depends upon insects keeping the environment healthy, amongst other things. Um, and if we can point that out to them, if we can, if we can make them realise how vital it is to the, their own well-being and the well-being of their children that we look after the environment, then you know, they'll come on board. But at the moment, we're just not getting that message out widely enough. That said, I mean, I, I do think we are perhaps close to some kind of tipping point. You know, the environment is becoming much more mainstream, partly because of climate change, but also uh, because of growing awareness about biodiversity crisis. You know, Extinction Rebellion um, as a phenomenon it suggests that something is happening. People are waking up. And we even saw our politicians, you know, in this ridiculous bidding war as to who could promise to plant the most trees at the last election. It was a bit dumb in many ways and I uh, but at least it showed that they'd realized there were votes in trees which is a step in the right direction and I think you know for the first time in a general election we saw the environment in the kind of the top five issues being discussed which has never happened in my lifetime before I don't think it's ever happened before full stop so you know we, we are making progress but we need to speed it up we need to somehow you know get the message out there faster and, and get as many people as we can on board but that's a challenge for everybody. I'm sorry, I'd, I'd add to that. A campaign like Action for Insects is important in that in that light as well. So, but I would say that, wouldn't I? Um, so, on to a few more specific things. Then, someone asked about river living invertebrates and whether they've um, suffered the same kinds of declines um, uh, as terrestrial living insects, um, and if so, what are the issues that are impacting them? The, the, so freshwater insects is, is less clear. I mean, most of the evidence suggests they've been really hard hit, um, particularly by, uh, you know, pollution is the biggest issue. Um, silting, fertilizers, eutrophication, um, and also to some degree pesticides getting into freshwater systems. Um, uh, but there have been some positive moves in recent years, particularly the driven by EU policy, the Water Frameworks Directive, has led to some rivers being cleaned up uh, quite substantially and some significant recoveries of, of freshwater insect populations. So it shows, you know, it can be done. All, we, we can fix these problems if we just, you know, take it seriously. Okay. We've got a number of questions grouped around the gardening aspect of, of what you said. And I think it's testimony to how popular and how important wildlife gardening is becoming. Um, someone asked about wildflower seed mixes and to pick up on something I think you said um, and, and talks about them being, uh, uh, how careful do we need to, to not be introducing invasive species through those mixes, non-domestic non species, and also about should wildflower mixes be local, i.e. should you buy, you know, from a national chain if uh, there is some genetic diversity of those wildflowers from area to area. Yeah, it's 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 complicated. Um, I mean, my my take is that if you're growing plants in your garden, um, there's no need necessarily to worry too much about um, uh, the origins because you're you're not trying to recreate. Gardens are chock full of a huge diversity of natives and non-natives already, all of which have been jumbled up um, from different geographic locations. Many of the plants we grow in our gardens come from the other side of the world. Um, I don't think there's much point in trying to say, to say to people, just grow native plants in your garden, because it's totally unrealistic. People aren't gonna buy that. And I, I, you know, there are lots of beautiful non-natives which, 
we regularly grow in our gardens, and, and many of which are very attractive to wildlife. Um, I think the, the, the sensitive area for me is if you're trying to recreate uh, a hay meadow or chalk grassland or a, a lowland hay meadow or whatever, uh, uh, if you're trying to recreate a species rich grassland, which is a, a special habitat um, uh, that, uh, as I highlighted, we've lost most of, um, then ideally you want as local a provenance as, as you can, not least because it will probably thrive better in the local conditions. Um, so perhaps the ideal solution is to use green hay, which is, is a, a very simple uh, method of essentially cutting. You, you need to have a donor field nearby, um, and then you basically take, take some a hay harvest and immediately transfer it to your target field and spread the hay. Um, and that can be really effective, done well, as you'll find advice about how to do it online. Failing that, trying to find a local seed company, but there is that that can be tricky because there aren't seed companies everywhere, and there are corners of the country where you just can't get hold of local provenance seed. And if there isn't a, a green hay supplied locally, then then it it can be problematic. Do you not go ahead at all, or do you accept sowing plants that aren't strictly speaking, you know? Uh, suited to your local environment uh, there's no simple answer to that one so i think in gardens i wouldn't get too hung up but basically if you're out in the countryside then you try as so far as possible to use local provenance it's green haying is something we do increasingly um, and we use our nature reserves as, as the donor sites now and look to yeah to use that the hay harvest there on local other sites that are deemed suitable so that's something that we've, we've really invested a lot of time and effort in doing over the last 10 years so it's, and it's been very successful i'd say going from that grand scale then to that someone asks what do you do if you haven't got a garden if you just live in a flat or apartment you only got a window box what's the best thing you can do as a wildlife gardener there to help insects so so do have a look at the report reversing insect declines because we've got lots of examples of things people have already done uh, including some really nice community projects where people have got involved in something happening at their local level, a community farm projects to sow wildflowers on roundabouts or to manage cemeteries for wildlife. And there's all sorts of really nice projects in there that, that you know, we can all learn from and copy. And if they were, if, if they were scaled up, um, could make a huge difference. Um, so, but more specifically, if you've got a balcony or a roof terrace, then even just some herbs in pots is better than nothing. You know, a marjoram in a, grows very well in a pot. It's flowering at the moment, and it's absolutely a magnet for pollinators. Um, so that's just one simple example. That, and even on the you know fifth floor of a block of flats, amazingly, pollinators will sniff out any flowers you manage to provide in a window box or whatever. Um, but failing that, if you've got absolutely nothing of your own, then and you can't get an allotment, um, then maybe start a local um, uh, community group. Um, you could campaign on uh, re getting the local authority to stop using pesticides in your town. That's there's quite a few campaigns along those lines at the moment. Lambeth is a really nice one that I've been involved with. Um, or you could do what, like the On the Verge people up in Stirling and sow wildflower seeds on road verges and roundabouts and so on. Um, I think that's a really inspiring little project. So there are lots of things you can do locally, even if you have no garden at all. As I say, do have a look at the report. And that report, I should say, is available um, on the Devon Wildlife Trust website under the Action for Insects pages. And alongside those are specific um, leaflets designed to help communities, to help individuals, and to help schools as well, actually um, take practical actions to help wildlife and insects in particular locally. So do have a look at those, please. Someone asked um, quite a contentious one, this one. So is it okay to collect to harvest wildflower seeds um, to plant elsewhere, presumably perhaps in your garden or elsewhere in the countryside? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I'm gonna take a risk and admit that I do it. Um, I mean, on a small scale, you know, I, just a, a pocket full of seeds if I see something um, to grow in my garden. Um, I think it's legal, um, uh, but I could, be, <laughs> I could be wrong. Um, I don't know. I'd be interested in what you think, Steve. Um, I think it's largely down to scale. I mean, we have had part, episodes in the past where people have literally on an almost industrial scale harvested, say, bluebells. Um, 
uh, from some of our ancient it, weapons. It, 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 yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, on a country it, it, walk, taking a bit of yellow, yellow rattle from a, a, a meadow and then distributing it in a place that's given a chance, so it has a chance to, to thrive, then I wouldn't have a problem with that. Um, but it is, yeah, it's illegal to dig up a, pl a wildflower thing and plant itself. But harvesting the seed, no. Uh, but if it was done carefully on a small scale, I don't think we'd have a problem with that. Just in the same way that, you know, foraging for a few mushrooms um, is not necessarily a bad thing. It's when people do it on a scale to, 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 to feed restaurants that sort of becomes a real problem. Yeah, okay. makes sense. And then another question, someone says here um, uh, about the, them seeing declines in the amount of uh, insects on windshields and cars. Is that a gauge of the, 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 the spiral downwards in populations of insects or is it because, because cars have become more aerodynamic over the last 20, 30 years? Uh, so Kent Wildlife Trust provided the answer to that because it's something that people have been talking about for years. But um, uh, uh, so it's certainly true that, you know, if you're of a certain age and I, I'm one of those people, you can remember a time when, you know, if you drove in the summer any distance, you'd have to clean the windscreen because it would get absolutely covered in splatted, dried on insect guts. And that just doesn't happen today. Um, but Maybe it's because there's more traffic, so you're usually driving behind somebody else. Um, uh, maybe it's because, as you say, cars are more streamlined. Um, so Kent Wildlife Trust did a sort of splatometer study. Now, I can't remember all of the details, so you, uh, but I'm sure you... Oh, it was maybe 10 years ago. Um, they asked people to put, to, to count the insects um, splatted on their number plates, I think they did. Uh, and then they repeated it more recently. Um, and they actually also, they, they got the make and model of the car uh, and they looked specifically at some vintage cars that were old fashioned and not aerodynamic. And they also found, so when they repeated the study recently, last year, I think it was, they found that even driving an old vintage car, there were still fewer splats than there had been 10 years ago. So it isn't the aerodynamics of the cars that have led to the decline, apparently. Okay, and this, this is a variation on, on what I call the wasp question, which I'm sure you've heard lots of times before. Is it? And this person says, is there any reason why I shouldn't spray mosquitoes? Or can you give me a reason not to spray mosquitoes? Well, uh, they're food for lots of other creatures. You know, the swallows and swifts and house martins are all in decline, probably because there isn't enough food for them. Um, bats eat mosquitoes as well and they're, they're in need of help um, but also you'll do collateral damage if you start spraying pesticides around you won't just kill the things you intend to kill um, you know this is one of the problems no one's invented an insecticide that just kills mosquitoes or aphids or whatever they kill all insects um, so you'll, you'll risk killing the butterflies and the ladybirds and everything else in your garden okay thank you um, and then someone asks, is there research or is there evidence showing before and after measurements of, um, of how successful wildflower planting is in people's gardens and on verges and so on, that, that, it, that shows that insects are actually helped, benefited by that planting? Yeah, so there's, I, I actually had a, uh, an MSc student called Lorna Blackmore who studied this up in, in Stirling, where they, in fact some of those plots that I showed were ones that she studied. And so she compared insect abundance in areas that had been sown with wildflower seeds with areas of that hadn't been treated that were still essentially uh, mown grass. And uh, if I can remember the fig figures correctly, there were roughly 50 times more bees and I think it was 13 times more hoverflies in the wildflower areas than in the the non-wildflower areas, so yeah, huge difference. Okay, thank you. And then uh, one final question that they, um, this person asked, if you just do one thing then for insects, you know, I mean, we'd hope people would do a multitude of things, but if they were to just start by doing one thing, what would you say um, that, that one thing should, should be? I would, I guess I'd start with something really simple, like just plant a, a 
a marjoram plant and then when it flowers sit and look at it and, and marvel at all the happy hoverflies and bumblebees and butterflies that it attracts and hopefully it'll inspire you to plant another marjoram plant and a cat mint and a lavender and some comfrey and stop using pesticides and put up a bee hotel and stop mowing the lawn and all the other things because we really need to do everything you know we, uh, one thing is is good um but um if if we're going to turn around these insect declines and generally look after wildlife more broadly um then we all need to do everything we can think of you know one step is good but taking all the steps we can is much better okay thanks Dave. that, that was really inspiring and I, um someone said on the comments how can we motivate people to, to do more, to take action, to, to help our governments take action? Well, I think this is a sort of starting place that we perhaps envisage. Um, I hope that it's inspired you as the audience to, to, to do things for, for wildlife, for, for insects. And just a couple of pointers to that. If you can visit that Action for Insects campaign page at devonwildlifetrust.org, that will give you lots of ideas of how to get involved with the Action for Insects campaign. Um, also to say, if you've enjoyed this talk, then there are others coming up in the coming weeks uh, online that we'll be presenting. Um, I know there was one on meadow making, so that might be something that the more ambitious of you wants to join in and think about doing, to help insects locally to you. And then there's one on beavers as well, um, which I know will be very popular. So you can sign up to those via, again, the R webpage. Um, and finally, from me, uh, just to say thank you for joining this afternoon. Uh, if you've enjoyed these talks and you like the kind of work that we do, then please also think about joining Devon Wildlife Trust. We're a charity that really relies on the support of its members. We have about 35,000 of those, but we can do a lot more work for wildlife if we grow that number. So please think about joining us. Thank you. Thank you again to Dave Goulson and goodbye until next time. Bye-bye. Gosh. I listened to